We've introduced the rotational analogs of velocity, acceleration, energy, and mass. But in order to get the full general theory of rotational motion, there's one more ingredient we need, and that is the rotational analog of force. This quantity is called torque. Just as we imagined force as a push or pull that tends to make things accelerate, change their velocity, we'll think of torque as another push or pull, but one that tends to make things rotate. The way we quantify this is going to be based off of how hard the push or pull is, the force, and where on the object the push or pull is focused. When I say the word torque, you probably think of maybe a way to describe how strong or powerful a truck is, or how hard you have to twist something to open it, or another case is where you want to tighten a bolt to a specific tightness, and in that case you use a wrench. A very precise wrench that measures the torque is called a torque wrench, actually. So let's start off with a wrench. Pulling on a bolt, trying to rotate it, as our model, we're thinking about how we'll quantify a torque. What we're looking for is a way to measure how likely a force is to create a rotational motion. So the concept behind torque is uh, a force that causes rotation. So let's say we have this wrench here. The bolt is down here as a hex hexagonal shape in the bottom left. And I've marked with an X the axis of rotation for this bolt. So any possible motions of this wrench, pushes or pulls, are going to be trying to rotate this system around that axis. Let's say we push on the handle of the wrench with a, with a given force at this specific spot. I think we could all agree that if you have this kind of push, you're going to end up rotating this whole wrench in a clockwise direction. Let's call the displacement between the axis of rotation and the point where the force is applied a displacement vector r. So we'll define r in this diagram as a vector that points from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force. So it's important where the force applied, but it's just as important where the object is going to rotate about. So clearly, if we have a larger force, we're going to be able to cause a larger tendency to rotate. So our formula for torque should increase the torque value with a larger force. Let us introduce the symbol tau, lowercase Greek letter tau, to represent the variable for torque in a situation. One of our intuitions is that the torque produced by a force should be proportional to that force. But force can't be the only thing that determines torque. Let's think again about the wrench situation. If we were to take this wrench 
and push on it with a different force direction. Let's say at this point here, we pulled directly outwards. I think most of us would agree pulling the wrench away from the bolt would not really cause the bolt uh, to rotate at all, right? It doesn't have that tangential component to it that it needs to spin things around. So in addition to the force, the torque is clearly going to depend on what the direction of the force is. So we have a second statement here that the torque is larger if F is more perpendicular to, to R. So we get the best torque possible by pushing in a tangential direction. Pulling or pushing the wrench towards or away from the bolt is not going to tend to spin or rotate it at all. So the torque would be zero. If the force and this displacement vector R are parallel. There's one more factor which will influence the value of the torque. <laughs> if I was to take this wrench and apply the same magnitude of force to this point very close to the axis of rotation, and apply the same magnitude of force to a point that was far away. Let's call this one F double prime and the green one F triple prime. We know that if something is hard to open, it helps to get a little bit more leverage. That's what we would say in normal English. In terms of quantities on this diagram, we can tell that if we push at the location of this green force way out on the edge of the handle, we're going to have more what's called you know, leverage to push this bolt around, to, to twist the whole system. If we push really close down here, we're pushing right by the neck of the wrench. It's kind of really hard to, to get a good, uh, a good push in there to turn things, to loosen them. So if we want to incorporate that concept into our quantification of torque, we also have the fact that the torque is larger for forces that are applied farther away from the point of rotation. So the torque value should be larger for larger distances. We can take this to the extreme by considering an R value of zero. If we pushed just directly on the bolt, we wouldn't really be able to rotate it at all. So pushing far out is better for making a larger torque. All of these intuitions about a value to represent torque can be summarized in a singular formula Although it requires us to use cross products, vector cross products, to write it in such a, a concise way, it includes all of these uh, aspects. <clears throat> so the torque equal to the cross product of the a radius vector from axis to the point where the force is applied, cross product with the force vector itself. If we recall some of the properties of this cross product, it's proportional to the size of R, the magnitude of R. It's a proportional to the magnitude of F. It's zero when the two vectors are parallel. It's maximized when the two vectors are perpendicular. And it scales between zero and the max as the angle between the vectors 
is uh, moved from parallel to perpendicular. So this has all of the properties that we said over here. For the cross product, we also have a formula for just the magnitude of the torque. This is often useful when we work in two-dimensional scenarios, which most of our problems are. The magnitude of R is R without the vector symbol. F is the magnitude of the force. And this angle here is the angle between the position vector and the force vector. So for the black force arrow here, it would be there. equal to 90 degrees. For the blue arrow, it would be here, equal to 90 degrees. For the green arrow, it would be there, equal to 90 degrees. And for the red arrow, it would actually be here, 180 degrees. Sine of 180 gives us zero. So that confirms our idea that this force that's parallel gives us zero torque. There's one final way to write out the torque, but I'll need a bit of room to draw the diagram for it. If we set up our problem on a coordinate grid of two dimensions, and put the origin of our coordinate system at the axis of rotation, we'll apply the force to a certain point described by a position vector with components x, y. The force vector could be described by its components, fx, fy. The cross product between these two vectors then gives us technically the z component of a torque vector that would be equal to x times the y component of the force minus y times the x component of the force. So if our vectors for force and displacement from the axis are given in rectangular components or xy components, then this formula is very efficient for computing the magnitude and sine of the torque. <clears throat> the formula over here is very useful if the displacement vector from the axis and the force are given in terms of magnitudes and directions. But the downfall of this formula is that it cannot tell us the sine of the torque, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. That we have to figure out from the diagram. Now that we have this idea of torque somewhat set up, we can begin thinking about Newton's laws of motion in terms of their rotational versions. The place where torque can be first applied is in our restatement of Newton's first law for rotation. This is going to be exact duplicate of the law for linear motion, except for the change of name of the quantities from linear quantities to angular quantities. Let's write it out. An object in rotation will remain in rotation unless acted upon by a torque. And this also applies to a state of zero rotation. An object rotating or not rotating will remain in that rotational state <clears throat> unless it experiences a torque.
an immediate corollary to this is that if the sum of all torques, which we'll call the net torque on an object, is zero, then the angular velocity of that object remains, uh, not zero, remains constant. So if it was zero, then it stays zero. And if it was non-zero, then it stays at its constant value. We call this situation where the net torque is zero, for good reason, we call this rotational equilibrium. So if there's no net torque, the object is in rotational equilibrium, doesn't change its angular velocity. This matches up directly with our concept of translational equilibrium, where a zero net force resulted in no acceleration or no change in linear velocity. Let's see how this concept of equilibrium can be uh, applied in a very useful device. In fact, if you're a fan of economics, this is one of the devices that gave rise to all of the bean counting on the planet. It's called a balance. And it is a way to use torque and equilibrium to find out the weight of things. It's called a beam balance because it's built out of a beam. The beam is suspended at some point, either by hanging it from a string or setting it on top of a narrow point called a fulcrum. The beam is usually marked out with measurements so that weights or unknown masses can be hung from different places. Generally the way this works is an unknown mass will be placed in a pan that's hung from a specific mark. Then on the other side of the beam balance a set of standardized masses will be hung and possibly adjusted left or right until the beam is completely stationary and motionless. The fact that the beam ends up stationary and motionless means that it's in equilibrium, and therefore the net torque on the beam is zero. We focus on the masses as our application, but in terms of the motion, it's really all about the beam rotating or not. So along the beam, let's call the distance from the axis to mass one, R1, and the distance from the axis to mass 2, r2. The equation of equilibrium will involve summing up the torques and setting it equal to zero. <clears throat> Let's think about the torque generated by each force. From mass 1, we have a downward force equal to mg, and the distance from the axis is r1. So in our formula for torque, which I'll remind us, is R F sine theta or X F Y minus Y F X, we'll have a distance of R1, a force magnitude of M1G due to gravity, and an angle of 90 degrees. That tells us that this torque should have a magnitude of R1 M1G times the sine of 90. The sine of 90 is 1, so I'll just leave it out. But what about the sine of this torque? When we use the formula here, we only obtain the magnitude of the torque. Does this force tend to rotate the beam counterclockwise or clockwise? 
it tends to rotate it counterclockwise. So the torque from mass one is a positive torque contribution. We can also figure this out methodically if we define the x and y axes and use the component version. Here we have a negative y component to the force and zero x component. We have a negative x component to the displacement since it's going to the left from the axis to the point where the force touches the beam. So we have a negative value for x, a negative value for fy, and zero for both of these. So we get negative times negative equals a positive torque. Following a similar logic for the torque caused by mass 2, we have a downwards force but a positive displacement component. So we have a positive x and a negative fy, giving us a negative torque overall. If we look at the directions of this torque, it would tend to rotate the beam clockwise. If we want to split this up ahead of time, we could write out torque of mass 1 equals R1 M1G, and the torque due to mass 2 is negative R2 M2G. To be in equilibrium, the desired state for a scale is to have these torques sum up to zero. And the small bit of simplification shows us that G cancels. And that the ultimate goal of calculating here is to multiply the mass by the radius and have that be equal between the two objects. All right, so if we have these marks on our beam, we can measure the two R values. If we have a standard set of masses for M1, we can measure M1. And so anything we put over here, provided that it's not too large or too small to get an accurate value, we will be able to use this equation to solve for mass two and use this as a way to measure the unknown mass of any object we place on it. Now let's do a problem where the angles, directions, components of the force and displacement vectors uh, play a role. I'm setting a situation here where there's a beam. It is not horizontal. It's an angle 10 degrees above horizontal. The x direction will be purely horizontal and the y direction will be considered vertical. And this beam is held up at its left edge by a pin or an axle. So that is the axis of rotation. And at the end of the beam, a cable is attached with a tension T. This cable has an angle that is, makes it perpendicular to the direction of the beam. Actually, that means it must be 10 degrees left of vertical. We'll label the length of the beam as R. And at the center of the beam, R over 2. We'll suspend a heavy object with a mass of M. I'm going to ne neglect any po potential mass for the beam itself. First, let's look at the torque due to the tension force. In this case, we know the magnitude and direction of the tension force and the magnitude and direction of the position that the tension force is applied at. So we'll use those. The magnitude of the tension force is T. The distance we've called R. And the angle between these is 90 degrees. 
This will tell me the magnitude of the torque due to tension is equal to T times R. If I want to know the magnitude and direction of this torque, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise, I will have to look at the diagram and reason with myself that the tension is going to cause a counterclockwise rotation, so a positive torque, T times R. If I wanted to do this in terms of x and y components, I would have to do something like the x component, which is r cosine theta, times the y component of the force, which would be t cosine theta, subtracted the y component of the displacement, which would be r sine theta, multiplied by the x component of the tension force, which would be negative t sine theta. In doing that, I would get r times t times the cosine of the angle squared plus the sine of the angle squared, which would simplify, times, uh, simplify to r times t. The same answer I got from the top formula. <coughs> The difference here is I don't have to guess what the sign of it is based on the diagram. I just have to look at the components. The other torque in this problem is the torque due to gravity. This has a displacement of r over 2, a magnitude of mg for its force, but the angle between these two vectors is not 90 degrees. Now it is uh, 90 degrees less 10. This angle in here, based on the geometry, is 80 degrees. This torque is also negative. If acting alone, it would cause a clockwise rotation. For this situation to be in equilibrium, the torque due to the tension and the torque due to gravity must sum to zero. TR plus negative R over 2 mg sine of 80 degrees must come out to zero. In solving this equilibrium equation, I'll set it up as if I need to know the tension in this cable in order to support the mass m. Therefore, I'll divide both sides by r. I will move the term in parentheses to the right, and I will get mg over 2 times the sine of the angle. So we see a result here that is a force, m times g is a force. It also depends on this factor r over 2. So if the mass was hung closer to the axle, it would require less force. And it also depends on this angle. At 90 degrees, the tension would be the largest necessary. But at higher angles, this tension can go uh, to zero. In fact, you might see this sort of set up in, say, a method for tightening a strap, a hold-down strap on the back of a truck. You pull a lever, which comes over like this, and your pull on the end of the lever is greatly multiplied by having uh, the strap attached closer to the axle, and so that gets a larger force tightening it than you could have provided by pulling on the strap directly. So in summary, torque 
is the analogy to force in rotational motion. One force can always be associated to one torque. It's a one-to-one -one association. But the value of torque depends on more than just the force. In the most general situation, the torque can be calculated by the cross product between the displacement vector between the axle and the force and the force vector itself. In simplified scenarios of two dimensions, the magnitude of the torque can be found from the product of the magnitude of R, the magnitude of F, and the angle between them. In situations where we need to know the sine or our vectors are expressed in terms of rectangular components, an efficient formula for the torque is to use the z component of the cross product, x times fy minus y times fx. Finally, if the sum of all applied torques is zero, then we say that the object is in rotational equilibrium and has a constant angular velocity.